Hey, how's it going guys? In today's video, I'm going to be taking you through quite an instructive positional game that I played recently online. And as any positional game begins, we have B4. And <clears throat> this game, it's, it's not necessarily the most exciting, but I think it's really instructive, like the way that certain squares are vital to control and there's some very interesting knight maneuvers later on in the game. Quickly before we jump into it, uh, I did hit 100 subscribers recently, so thank you very much for anyone who has subscribed. And if you haven't yet, join the party. Um, daily videos will continue, so stay tuned. And if you enjoy this video, please drop a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. But with that said, G6. I like to play this King's Indian setup. It's kind of just like a pet opening. But after, so after Knight C3, you would expect G Bishop G7, right? But I play D5, which is the best move. The reason I play D5 is because my opponents put his Knight on C3, which means that C4 can't be played because the Knight blocks it. Had my opponent gone something like I don't know, just knight bd2 for the sake of it. And after d5, my opponent can play c4. And here, it's not really what I like to play. Personally, what I like to do in these positions is play d5, get my bishop being ketoed, and once a knight lands on f3 and the e-pawn is moved, I like to bring my bishop to g4 to create a pin with the intention of exchanging my bishop for the knight or my opponent's light squared bishop if it comes to e2 but essentially my bishop goes out there to die and i build up a bit of a pawn wall with e6 and c6 now that my light squared bishop is traded off so with my light squared bishop off the board i can put my pawns on light squares to compensate for that and that is possible because knight c3 has been played so my opponent can't play a quick c4 to try and attack my center and it allows me time to build it up so bishop e2 e6 again like i say building up this pawn wall we have knight e5 which attacks my bishop and forces me to trade and then i play knight b to d7 again not to c6 i don't go knight c6 because I don't really want this trade for a start because my pawn structure is a bit weak. The queen can come to a6 and target some weak light squares. And I would much rather just play pawn to c6. So I go knight bd7, leaving that option open, but still challenging the central knight. <clears throat> we have long castle. Here I could castle short, but I was really worried that my opponent had a strong attack after h4 and i thought after something like g4 h5 could be played and my attack is going to take a long time because my g6 pawn acts as a hook for his pawn to attack and force a file open whereas if his pawns all sitting on the back rank i, I i'm going to struggle to actually force any lines to open up against his king so after my opponent long castles, instead of um, instead of castling short, I take on e5 first, and then I play queen d7. The reason I exchange first is because I want to free the d7 square up so that I can castle queenside. So you might say, why don't you just go queen e7 then? I'm sure that's a fine move, but my logic is that with queen d7, I don't allow the queen to come out to b5 or the knight to come out to b5 which i was worried about um well the knight can still come to b5 but i feel less threatened because my queen actually controls the light squares so my opponent goes g4 which is a nice move because he threatens g5 to force my knight to move and then he gets to trade dark squares bishops and with all my pawns on light squares arguably that's very weakening for my pawns to be on light squares with the dark squared bishops off the board because then my dark squares will be weak. I castle queenside regardless 
my opponent goes h4. I was expecting g5 straight away. I was going to go knight h5, trade the bishops. And I thought that my control of the light squares is good enough um, because I can undermine this pawn with h6 and break out on the king side. And my king is very safe. But he goes as h4. And I assumed his intention was to play h5. So I went knight to e8 immediately to trade the bishops. And then after h5, which is what he played, at some point I wanted to take and then free up the f5 square for the knight. That was the intention. But I first play c6. Because... It takes away the b5 square completely from my opponent's pieces, supports the d5 pawn further, and it opens up the opportunity to play e5 at some point now that the d5 pawn has more cover. Not yet, but it opens up the possibility. f4, I was very happy to see, because it just further weakens his light squares. Like, the e3 pawn is now a backwards pawn, and it might struggle to go to e4. And if I can land a knight on e4, I'm probably going to be quite happy. I go king b8, which wasn't a great move. It was unnecessary. I should have gone for the previous plan of putting the knight on f5. Especially now this pawn had advanced to f4. For two reasons. Firstly e3 is no longer defended by a pawn, so the queen is tied down to the defense of the pawn because the knight's attacking it. And secondly, now the pawn has gone to f4, it can't go to f3 to support an e4 push that would kick the knight out. Now if the pawn ever comes to e4, it's going to be taken, and then a piece will have to take back, be it the knight or the queen, and this knight will remain unassailable on f5. But king b8, queen h2, trying to just get the queen on this long diagonal. And I take on h5. Now f5 check is a possibility. But I was just going to play queen c7 and go, look bro, queen trade. Because if he takes, f6 seems to be the move. And then after knight e8, g5 to support the f6 pawn. But here... Probably I would play h6 and we'd get, oh, I actually can't take that, rook g8, okay, that's kind of complicated, but interesting, he actually just takes back and then I get the whole idea of knight f5 that I previously mentioned, where this pawn will struggle to move forward to attack the knight and e3 is under attack, and this knight, therefore, is basically a god. So queen h3 defends e3. I go rook g8, taking control of the file, and he puts a rook on g1. Now, taking would not be the best of ideas because my rook can't go to g8 because it'll be taken, and my opponent has control of the file. Now what works in my favour is this rook can't come to g7 because my knight defends it. But at some point if I move my knight, say I want to reroute it through d6 to e4, then this square will become vulnerable and rooks on your opponent's second rank are always very strong. So I just go queen e7, which looks like a cryptic move, but consider the fact that my pawns are on light squares so my queen on a dark square can access the holes in my position and therefore has more room to maneuver. And I'm setting up ideas of bringing the queen to h4 to trade the queens. Because I feel like I've got a better end game here because my opponent has this weak backward pawn on e3. Which again, will struggle to advance and even if it does, will leave the f4 pawn very weak because it will be isolated once I trade. So rook d to f1. I've got to be honest, I didn't really understand this move. Maybe the idea was to play e4 and have a defender of f4 ready. I don't know. But I played queen h4 and we trade queens 
And here I was very happy. Because if something like rook to h1 is played, I just go straight back to f5. I threaten a fork. And if the opponent comes back, the e3 pawn hangs. So it's not really easy to kick my knight out. He goes knight e2. Again, I don't... I didn't really understand what the point was. I mean, I suppose the knight on c3 can't really go anywhere because the way that I've placed my pawns really restricts it. I go rook g2. It looks like a mouse slip. It looks like I attempted to... Well, I tried to take the rook. But the point is, after the exchange, my knight now attacks e3. So the rook can't attack because... I can go to e3. The computer says that after rook g7, white is fine. But it's not easy because my knight is still really strong and defends h6 and attacks d4 and stops the forward movement of this pawn. This pawn is weak. It's a tough position. He instead goes king d2 to defend the pawn. And I go knight to h4. Why knight h4? So firstly, it gives me a way out, because my knight can get trapped, potentially. If I play a couple of nothing moves, and we get a situation like this, the knight doesn't ha actually have a way out. I can defend the knight, but the knight's basically stuck. So I don't want that to happen. So I go to h4 h4 allows me to come back to f5 which again is a fantastic square for the knight and rook g1 is unplayable which he would love to play because of knight f3 check and i pick up the rook so it stops my opponent from bringing his rook to the file that he'd like to so after rook f2 i get to play rook g8 and i take control of the file this didn't work previously because if i immediately play rook to g8, computer gives f5, and white is breaking apart my pawn structure, so with knight h4, f5 is unplayable because I take it. So rook f2, rook g8, take control of the file, knight c1, and we see the point of white's maneuver now, he wants to come to d3 to try and access the e5 and c5 squares playing on the fact that my pawns are all on light squares. So I go b6. b6 is played because after knight d3, I can play f6. And these two moves cover the weak dark squares. The opponent can bring his knight to b4, but then I can play king b7 and cover my opponent's entry points. And his knight struggles to get into the game. And again, the rook can't attack my knight because there's a fork. <clears throat> it's not easy for my opponent to deal with this position, even though the computer only gives me minus 0.6. My opponent plays king e2, which defends the f3 square, keeps an eye on e3, and potentially allows rook h2. I play rook to g3, with the intention of just keeping an eye on this e3 pawn. So if a move like rook to h2 is played, knight f5, and this e3 pawn is going to die, because he can't defend it. So I'm trying to suffocate my opponent. My domination of the g file gives my rook much better mobility than his rook, and I want to make sure my opponent's rook can't access the g file, so that I can kind of prod around in his position force him to make potentially weakening, weakening moves and restrict, you know, his rook, like I said, from the g-file, and his knight is restricted from entering my position. He's forced to play defense. So king e2, rook g3, knight e1. My opponent defends well. He, tr he wants to play knight to f3, because if I play a lazy move, then knight f3, if all this gets traded... White's probably a little bit better practically, just because his king's a bit more active than mine. So knight e1 is a good move. I play king c7, and after knight to f3, I was just going to play knight to f5. Again, the f6 pawn cuts off my opponent's 
attempts to enter my position. He still can't challenge for the G file. His king can't go to F1 to try and lend support to that, to the G2 square, because he free hangs. So he goes C3 instead, just over protecting D4, which is a strange move. And it allows Rook to H3. And the H5 pawn is going to be under attack. The reason I do it in that move order, so my plan is Rook to H3, Knight to F5, Rook takes H5. The reason I do that and not Knight to F5 first is because of Rook to F3. And my Rook now can't access the H3 square because the Rook defends it. So if I do it in this move order, the rook can't come to f3 because then the knight takes it. And it also can't go to g2 because the knight defends that square. It's really important to try and restrict your opponent's pieces like this. And I was really happy with this game because of that. So knight to f3 tries to exchange the knights. I could exchange the knights here and win a pawn. But being one pawn up in a rook versus rook endgame it's not it's 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 not easy to convert with the knights on the board especially with the quality of my knight compared to his knight i feel like i've got more winning chances because again his knight can't do anything so rook h2 now i exchange the rooks and play knight g3 check winning the pawn this way and it's much easier to convert uh, a pawn up knight versus knight than rook versus rook because of some basically it's because there's so many other pawns on the board and again this knight can't get into the game whereas his rook would have been able to infiltrate through the g file in the previous variation where the knights get traded so king g4 attacks the knight knight g7 and all these squares are protected by either my knight or my pawns to disallow his king forward movement. If the knight goes to f3, which it does, it again has no forward movement. King d6, knight h4, again, g6 is defended and f5 is defended, so the knight can't go forward. His king also can't go forward. So king e7. I'm up a pawn, so I would like to push it. So I try to get my king closer. B3, A5, A3, C5. Here I'm just trying to soften up my opponent's queen side because my king is still closer to the queen side. I could, if um, a bunch of pawns get traded, could, could come and pick one off. So my opponent goes king F3, trying to get closer. I play knight E8. Because again, the knight can't infiltrate. And now that the king stepped back, my knight doesn't need to guard the h5 square anymore. Because if, if I'd have gone knight e8 here, the king could maybe go to h5 and try and get to my h7 pawn. Although the computer tells me not to care and just to let the king march over there and then win c3. Which makes sense. But I thought I'd keep it simple. So knight e8, e4, knight d6, takes, 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 takes. Got a bunch of trades. <clears throat> and my knight on d6 is really good. Because it could come to e4 to attack c3. But it also controls the f5 square. Again, preventing this knight from coming forward. King e3, king e6, b4, takes, takes. And here... I don't want to I don't want to take on b4 because then my opponent actually has quite a strong passed pawn. I instead play a4. And it's crazy because a4 is completely winning and a takes b4 is just mildly better. So instead, I play a4, 
a4 is a great move because my knight controls the b5 square, meaning his pawn can't advance. But also, if my knight gets access to c4 or b5, then I'm attacking a3. And if a3 falls, my pawn is really, really quick to advance. So king d4, knight b5 check, king c5, and I take on a3. After knight f3, I go h5. I like the move h5, because after knight d4 check, king d7, white does win my d5 pawn. But I have h4, and my opponent is forced to bring his knight back to f3. This pawn keeps the knight from advancing any point. But he also has to monitor h2, because otherwise I'm going to promote. So his knight is essentially tied down to my pawn. My knight is not. So after king d4, knight b5, king c4, I can just push a3. Because if he takes my knight, then I'm going to queen. And his king's too far away. So he has to go king to b3 to stop me from advancing. But now my knight also not only protects my pawn, but blocks his pawn from advancing. So his knight is tied up, his king is tied up, and his pawn can't move because I've got a pawn there. Meaning that my king is free to go wherever he wants, and none of my opponent's pieces can move to stop him. So king e6, knight h2, king f5, he can't stop me from taking the pawn, and then I'm going to push this pawn. He's going to have to sacrifice the knight for this pawn, and then this pawn is going to promote. So my opponent resigns. And I win. And I thought it was a really interesting game. Like just the restriction of my opponent's pieces. And the battle along the G file. In an end game where. It's only rook and knight versus rook and knight. But there's still a lot of play left in the position. Even with equal pawns. The activity of my pieces. Is just overwhelming. And after the pawns won. My knight is just of such a better quality than his knight because of the way my pawns are positioned that eventually his pieces all just get tied up and my king is free to march forward and win the game. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.